data sets through the application of machine learning and statistical modeling. Josh, take it away. Sounds good. So, um, start with, I'm going to do kind of the same thing, collapsing both those last two talks into one, where I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do as our general mission, and then go into a little bit of the workloads that we deal with. Um, and then Graham's going to go into some of the more technical details regarding um, kind of how our systems actually operate. Um, so for over 30 years, the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute has been serving the community at the University of Minnesota and around the rest of the state of Minnesota, um, really in any research area people are interested in, um, as well as working with external partners, i.e., you know, companies, uh, to provide computational services when needed. And so we're part of sort of the main research computing group on campus um, and part of our Office of the Vice President for Research. So as of November 15th, I got kind of fairly new stats, uh, we have 878 different research groups working on our systems with a total of 4,837 active users. Um, we're a you know, big land grant university. This covers pretty much any field you can imagine among those 878 groups. Um, and so as a result, uh, as I'll get into, uh, we have a lot of different use cases that are hitting our file systems and our computers. Um, and as a result, there's fairly, really a very diverse need here in terms of what people expect out of our systems. So I am gonna name names a little bit here. Um, in that, so our main file system is 6.7 petabytes of Panassis. We actually have a little bit more than that and Graham will go into the details of that, but this represents sort of our active project space and our scratch computing space, uh, which uh, I have some details on in a second. We do have a second tier, which we use to get some of the longer term project, projects off of this sort of active processing area. Um, and it's an object store um, that we've built based on uh, Ceph cluster. And then we have a tape library that we use to sort of offload a lot of the things. So we're really trying to keep uh, the panaceas that we have fully focused on the more active solutions, but with that many users and that many groups, um, there's only so much we can do there. So we have a mix of sort of old and new data on the systems. Yeah? How do you, how do you move the data from the different tiers? Um, so the question was, how do we move the data from the different tiers? And right now, we largely rely on the different users to do that themselves with some education. Uh, we've installed Globus endpoints on all three of those. And so that's our primary thing we direct people to. They can just kind of log in on the two and direct it to copy. We're always working on other ways to make that easier for people. Um, so of those 6 point, my numbers came out slightly different, 6.5 petabytes of storage that we have available, 5.5 um, of this is project space. So these, these are allocated to individual user groups to use kind of as they see fit. Um, and then we keep one petabyte in reserve as a scratch space, which is meant for 30-day um, turnaround on data. Um, and I think Graham might cover some details of this, but that, I mean, the data is turning over much faster than every 30 days. There's, there's heavy churn on that system. Um, and I guess one of the main differences too is the project space is uh, snapshotted to an extent that I don't remember right offhand, uh, but the scratch space is just a single copy space for sort of fast computation. We have, um, I'm actually leaving out our supercomputer that's about to be retired, and I'm covering the two supercomputers that we sort of have, well, from our point of view, this is one supercomputer in two different stages. So Masabi is our um, older system here with 741 nodes and 24 cores. Um, one thing I sort of skipped over is that we keep the Panassa system globally mounted on all computing systems that we have present. Um, and so we have Masabi here, we have Mongi, which is an ex uh, expansion that's coming out right now. Um, and then we will have a, what we're calling Masabi plus one, which is, which is a newer system we'll be getting at one point um, that will also be accessing this exact same space. Um, and Graham's gonna get into some details about really how that has really changed how users on our systems have worked, the ability to have those mounted across those different spaces, and a little bit of discussion about how things were before we did that. Um, so just in terms of job load, I've kind of looked up what the specs were per week. 
We have 30, 350 active users per week on average, uh, mounting about 200,000 submitted jobs, which is about 2.2 million core hours. Um, and the text there is super tiny, but this is a plot of the different fields and how much CPU hours they're using each. Um, Why is chemistry, is it, is it the lots of jobs or is that each job is very complicated? It's both. It shows up as a lot of um, HPC work. Right, so it's, it's definitely both. Um, a mixture of them submitting gigantic job arrays and running software that simulations for like uh, chemical dynamic, like dynamic simulations that can be scaled really as large as whatever computing power is available. Um, and sort of in terms of storage usage, they actually represent a relatively smaller total usage case, though I think they can definitely um, make a lot of requests in and out. Um, but really in terms of our total usage is our genetics, health sciences, and biology that are really driving the, the largest consumption on our systems. Um, and here's kind of a chart that shows sort of that, um, a plot of who's using the most CPU hours on our system versus the total number of terabytes used by that discipline within our, our space. And so you can see chemistry, it's log scaled by the way, chemistry way off there to the right uh, with biology and all these different synonyms for biology basically representing the main usage on our system. And the, really the difference there is that biology is largely static sort of consumption. They tend to have reference files they load on that they access those same files over and over again, where chemistry and people in some of the other fields that are doing more like AI workloads are maybe writing millions of files and then deleting millions of files, but they might be small and, and, not, and there's a lot more churn going on. Um, I think that brings us to Graham. So Graham Allen is uh, IT, the Associate Director uh, for Advanced Systems Operations at MSI. After studying medicine and then physics at St. Andrews University in Scotland, Graham fell into, with a bad crowd? Bad crowd of Minnesota physicists at, is that Femilab? Femilab. Femilab. Femilab, outside Chicago. And uh, found himself at the University of Minnesota, managing an assortment of uh, physics research and other Systems building many successful large-scale data storage systems and compute clusters. So, so quick disclaimer, um, I came to Minnesota Supercomputing Institute in around mid-2016, and for a lot of that time, I, sp I spent a lot of time uh, working on our OpenStack and Ceph um, projects, so my, my Background in Panassas is not super deep. We have some people in the room here who I'm sure can pick out my reconstruction of history as faulty, should, should that be necessary. So um, uh, MSI got its first Panassas systems in 2008, but that's really beyond the archaeology I was able to do. Um, our first major expansion was in December 2012. And the really significant part of that was deploying that as a global file system across all of our clusters. Um, I think if you talk to a lot of our users, that was one of the biggest changes that made their life better, as opposed to having completely separate file systems on each cluster. Uh, so, so far we've had six generations of Active Store at MSI, and this shows how our capacity has grown over time from that first deployment in uh, late 2012, one and a half petabytes, and we're up to, well, depends how you measure it. We all seem to have come up with different numbers, <laughs> but uh, around about seven petabytes. And uh, this just shows how we've arranged the storage in a, in a hardware sense. We have a single realm divided into four, four main blade sets. Three of them are used for general purpose project storage, and one is our global scratch. Uh, we connect the, pan uh, the Panassas system to the HPC clusters through um, some Mellanox 6036 and Finiband gateways. So we have uh, like an overall bandwidth of about 320 gigabits per second to, to Masabi and Bangi. And again, the, the really important part to our users is that it's all globally mounted. So uh, we reference our like, 
older cluster, Atasca here, which is due to be decommissioned in January, and uh, Misabi and Mangi are the two premium clusters now. So the, u the user project storage is organized by PI, PI group, and uh, each group can request like a, a default like storage quota of up to 20 terabytes, for which they, they, there's no cost for them. They can request more than that, but there'd be some cost for that. Uh, we snapshot this area. I think there's a week of daily snapshots and a month of weekly. Uh, and we also back up the entire five or so petabytes to tape, which perhaps we shouldn't be doing. We really like to look at being more focused with that and getting our users to identify what data they actually value. Then we have round about a petabyte of global scratch. Uh, we do have the quotas enabled on this, but not enforced, so we can track if anyone's using up a egregious amount of the storage. We also reserve 20% of the storage um, unallocated so that the volume doesn't slow down as it fills up. And, and so one of the things our users really like is that the performance characteristics are really similar between the, the project storage and Scratch. Um, so if we look back at the um, growth of storage over time, uh, the trajectory has actually slowed some part for the project areas by, um, in the last couple of years, we've had much clearer policies about how much storage the groups get allocated. And we've been building some tools to help them like, figure out what data is being actively used and help them move, it, move their colder data to the second tier. Um, of course, the flip side is this, is, of this is the second tier has doubled in size <laughs> in the last couple of years. Um, at the same time, we've got a much increased demand for like, more flexible storage, which aren't specifically tied to individual projects. We've got a lot of large shared data sets coming online, which might have one or two um, data custodians who then curate the data set and grant access to interested parties. So that, that's an area we're seeing a lot of growth. And um, on the front of Scratch, however big we build it, it's always full. So a lot of the challenges with our user storage are just managing the data and helping the users to manage the data. So we have a bunch of scripts which crawl the the storage to index the data and um, put it into a database where we can present um, these kind of histograms of, of how many f files and how much capacity the, the group has tied up of um, fresh or cold untouched data. And um, it also produces a list of like suggested data sets that they could migrate to the low cost storage to tier two. So this is what you were alluding to. It's kind of a manual HSM. Um, yeah. So that's a, a lot of time. Is that still kept on spinning disk, or wh wh where do you guys move it off to tape at some point? This, this plot here shows that uh, this is a, a, like a sample research group showing the data on Panassas. That's, you, you have five-year-old data on Panassas still? Wow. Yeah. Well, what we can do is provide hint, hints to the, to the data owner. I mean, they have maybe have a 20 terabyte quota on there, and they need to fit within that. They're really only uh, motivated to move the old data off when they want to bring fresher data in. So that, that's one challenge. Uh, even the, the scripts crawling, crawling the storage to generate like the, the data is very metadata intensive and probably competing with the user workloads to some extent. And it takes um, pretty close to a week for each pass of that to run. Thanks. Um, so is that like a script you guys have written, or? Yeah, okay. this is an in-house script. Have you heard of Robinhood? This is a lead into a shameless plug, so you can. I have not. 
Okay. We'd love to hear more. So yeah, that that does this. Um, and we had an intern this past summer uh, that was a, a Penn State PhD candidate that wrote a plugin to use snapshots to basically query that information so you don't do the the tree walk. Cool. So that's it's called Robinhood. Robinhood. So we have a we have a Panassas push from the rich. to plug in for this. We can talk afterwards about it, but that was something. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very intriguing. <laughs> and we have similar challenges with Scratch. I mean, diff different in specifics, but general nature. Um, you know, when you have a, a nominal 30 day lifespan, you naturally have. Um, no one would ever dream of gaming the system and running through and touching their files. Things. But we have a similar set of scripts trying to crawl Scratch to look for and expire data. And um, with our current Scratch size of about 800 terabytes, that script pretty much exceeds its runtime of 20 hours every day. Um, then on Scratch, we, all, we also, is where we also tend to see any performance issues. And that's usually we have, you know, we have a, a huge variety of user workloads on the system. So we tend to find people who have <laughs> jobs that which perform a like, huge amount of file creation, deletion. And uh, last week, we were looking at, at uh, a performance issue on Scratch where we find the user running, I think, 100. I won't say what the actual process was, but 100 or so, which were reading from an input directory with like half a million files in it. Yeah, we, we have a similar problem. <laughs> I can tell you, you can change the maximum allowed file per directory limit, which is exactly what we do. I put it at 75,000. Oh, you, so you prevent them from <laughs> yes, creating Yes, I prevent them from shooting themselves in the foot, yeah, yeah. which otherwise That's they will policy, do. policy uh, issue. Yeah. As, as Jose mentioned, each line that comes from the boat is a single file. The problem is if a user does not construct their job properly and doesn't give it the proper output file, instead of combining each of those lines into a single output file, it will create millions of output files. And so we've had situations where somebody will write 500,000 files and it will literally take me a month to clean it out of that directory yeah. because of the metadata issue. Yeah. So I went I, to our developers and I said, what's the max a real job would put out? And he's like, oh, 20,000. Okay, I'm setting the limit at 75. <laughs> so. Yeah. We kind of have a, a huge like, variance in the kinds of jobs our users run. So we certainly discussed this, but well, as you know, it's a political problem, not a technical one. Um, but it's very true because they're not only shooting themselves in the foot, they're shooting every one of our users in the foot. <laughs> um, Okay, so just a quick recap. I mean, the problems that we've really seen solved by Panassas very effectively are the way it can handle all these very varied workloads without the users needing to make any kind of hard decisions. I mean, they really need to decide, uh, am I running my project space or in Scratch? And that's a function of how long is the data going to live? How much space do I have available? Um, and our administration efforts are, are really very low. We have probably well under one FTE of storage administrator. Um, but we're looking forward very much to Panassas Ultra. I think the, a lot of the architectural changes with um, putting the metadata on NVMe are going to mitigate some of the problematic workloads we see, where um, they're very metadata heavy operations. And we know our users will also happily find ways to consume every last piece of performance that the new hardware will bring. So that's the end. So if anyone has any questions. <laughs> thank, thank you, Graham, Josh.